Let's continue in our series about the Aston Martin Valkyrie. If you want to know more about the background and politics of the project, check out my other video in the description. If you want to support the channel, please consider becoming a B-Sport Club member, which will also give you early access to the videos. After winning four world championships in a row, Red Bull experienced a major setback at the beginning of the 2014 season. Renault had produced a not very competitive engine for the new hybrid F1 era, and Mercedes was miles ahead. After Newey, Horner and Michael visited Carlos Ghosn, CEO of Renault and Nissan at that time, they had the feeling that Renault wouldn't do whatever they can to catch up. Mercedes and Ferrari wouldn't give their engines to Red Bull because they didn't want to be beaten by their own engines. So Red Bull was stuck with Renault engines for the foreseeable future. From that point on, Newey lost interest in the F1 operation, to a certain degree, because it was clear that Red Bull cars wouldn't be competitive for the following years, no matter how good chassis and aerodynamics were. So Newey was looking for a new challenge. First, he was approached by Mercedes' Niki Lauda, who tried to win him over as their new technical director. But since the team was already dominant, Newey turned this offer down. Then, he was approached by Ferrari for their racing and road car development, and by Porsche for their LMP1 program. But again, he turned both offers down, because he felt at home at Red Bull. He wanted to stay at the Milton Keynes team, that he helped building from the ground up. A future budget cap was already a topic at this time, and so Newey and Horner were working on a plan on how they could reduce the size of the F1 team in the long-term future without laying off their highly qualified staff. The idea was to found another company that is using F1 technology in other areas, Red Bull Advanced Technologies. And that was the perfect basis for Newey's new challenges. So he could still stay with Red Bull and supervise the F1 design, but he could spend around half of his time on other projects. One thing that was very interesting about the earlier Ferrari offer was that it included the design of road cars, something Newey had been fascinated by since his childhood, building the ultimate sports car. And earlier, in 2010, PlayStation approached him to design a no-rules F1 car for their video game, the Red Bull X1. So the idea to design a no-rules road car was always on his bucket list and the creation of Red Bull Advanced Technologies now made it possible. So Newey sat down, started with a clean sheet of paper and defined what he wanted to reach. First of all, a pretty car. A piece of art that people would like to look at. So you would enjoy it even if it doesn't drive. A road car that goes to a track, laps faster than anybody else and drives back comfortably. By comfortable, he really meant a comfortable ride and no rattling, shaking track toy. He even considered some small luggage space. And it should be small, nimble, responsive and sound nice. When you start designing a car, you start with packaging. Based on his motorsport experience, Newey chose a mid-engine layout. The engine should be a stressed member and be directly connected to the monocoque. The gearbox is also a structural member and the rear suspension mounts to it, like a race car. That was the main structure, but also the car should be the fastest vehicle on track and that means aerodynamics. Since that's the favorite topic of Adrian Newey, everything else was compromised for the aerodynamic concept of the car. First of all, the passengers have a reclined seating position with raised feet like in F1. It's very comfortable, but also keeps the frontal area small, the center of gravity low and allows a high nose, which gives space for a front wing. Then, to use space more efficiently and to create a narrower nose, the passengers are turned by 5 degree. This is actually the opposite of what Viper engineers were doing because of the massive torque and flywheel there, but back to the Valkyrie. Ground effect became the new design trend in F1 at the end of the 1970s just when Newey was about to finish his study in Southampton. Everybody talked about it, but not many understood the topic, and most of one teams had design departments with less than 30 engineers, most of them mechanical engineers who were not familiar with ground effect aerodynamics. So, since ground effect was the hot topic in F1, sports cars didn't use the effect yet, and Newey was seeking an engineering job in motorsport, he called his final year project 
ground effect aerodynamics as applied to a sports car. So already during his study, he was working on two-seater sports cars with ground effect. And during his work of the following 35 years, he gained a lot more experience that we can now see in the Valkyrie design. Ground effect means that air underneath the car gets accelerated, which results in lower pressure and hence downforce. Important here is the expansion ratio between the smallest and largest cross-section of the underbody. The higher the expansion ratio, the faster the flow, the more downforce I can reach. Now, the easiest way of increasing the expansion ratio is to lower the car. Because reducing ride height by 5mm at the closest point means it's for example 50% closer to the ground, where it's only 2% closer at the back. So I have a higher expansion ratio. But why is the Valkyrie not close to the ground? Why is there so much space underneath the car? The problem is that such a concept makes the car very sensitive to ride height changes. You create suction peaks and suck the car onto the ground. But if it's too close, you suddenly lose that downforce, which results in bouncing. Something we know from 2022 F1 cars. Another factor besides the expansion ratio is the mass flow underneath the car. The more air you have underneath the car, the more forces you can generate with it. And this is what the Valkyrie is doing. At the front, we have a high, slim nose, which disturbs the front wing as little as possible. The front wing itself consists of main element, a pre-wing, and two flaps either side. These flaps curl down to avoid side vortices outboard. Inboard, on the other hand, they are shaped like in F1, and position an, in F1 called, Y250 either side. This vortex is then guided outboard by the massive barge board, and because of its rotation helps to seal the floor at the sides. The barge board helps to push the front rear wake outboard to keep a clean underbody flow. At the same time, the outside boards try to keep the front rear wake close to the car to keep the real frontal area small. The front push rod suspension tries to disturb the flow as little as possible and is fully arrow shaped. Even the connection to the chassis is a fully arrow shaped element that in F1 is a metal part that allows suspension movement through its own bending. Here it looks more like a kind of rubber material to cover the joints. Also we can see a structure that catches the tire squared vortex to avoid it from spilling underneath the car. One of Newey's handwritings on F1 cars is the V-shaped cross-section of his monocoques to avoid separations of the counter-rotating vortices of the front wing. Also, at the Valkyrie we can see a gently rounded underside of the top. The leading edge of the underbody is shadowed by the lower suspension arm. A bit further back sits the engine as low as possible. To allow for the huge tunnels underneath the car, they pushed the exhaust to a higher position. Also, the gearbox is an extreme design that we haven't seen like this on another road car before. The low sitting crankshaft of the engine means that the intake shaft of the gearbox is low as well. It then transmits the power upwards to the differential, like an F1 car. Also, like an F1, the lower wishbone sits in line with the drive shafts, so there are less components disturbing the airflow and there is more space underneath for the huge tunnels. We will learn more about engine and gearbox in the next part. Behind the rear wheels, the Valkyrie shows an extreme side expansion which contributes to accelerating the air underneath the car. The aerodynamics on top of the car feature a pocket in front where the Viper is mounted and it locates the cabin air intake. There are also some cutouts either side to improve extraction from the front axle and hence increase downforce. The car has a roof scoop, but it's pretty far back and pretty low. It takes a second look to understand the complex shape of the engine cover, and I've never seen a more complex roof inlet than this. Basically, there's a huge nacre duct with a raised scoop sitting in the middle. That way, the roof scoop does not increase frontal area, and the nacre duct shape helps to drag more clean air towards the intake. The flow is then spread into two larger cross-sectional areas to slow it down before flowing through the two air filters. That way, you have less pressure drop through the filters. At the same time, the part of the roof scoop underneath the actual inlet is also used as an inlet. Because of the boundary layer is not the cleanest air there, 
but there is still higher pressure which could be used, otherwise it's drag. They then guide this flow through a smaller cross-section to accelerate and re-energize it and after that guide it to the air filters too. When the cover is open, you can see what efficient packaging really means. There is no unused space in this car. At the back, we have a two-element rear wing that is blown from underneath by the exhaust. More exhaust flow will increase rear wing performance here. And because the wing is so low, it works like a beam wing in F1. In this case here, it will help to improve cooling and it will support the diffuser to produce more downforce. So I hope you liked this little insight and let me know your thoughts on the Valkyrie below. We will continue with the detailed tech analysis in the next part.